Robert England terrorizing people throughout the night isn't exactly a rare sight to see. As the star of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, he has been in some of the most popular horror movies ever made. His performance has made the dream-stalking Freddy Krueger a genre icon, but he has around 150 screen credits where he didn't play Freddy. With that kind of output, it's not surprising that the occasional project slips under the radar. And today, we're going to shine the spotlight on one of those projects, a film where England plays a weaselly projectionist who traps Finn Jones in a movie theater overnight. It's Freddy vs. Iron Fist in The Last Showing, aka the best horror movie you never saw. British writer and director Phil Hawkins had made multiple shorts and a few features, but he hadn't worked in the horror genre yet. Dramas, thrillers, comedies, documentaries, he had done it all. But he felt like it was a rite of passage for any filmmaker to make a horror movie. So he began writing one, drawing from his own personal experience of being locked in a multiplex cinema. The title was The Last Showing, as the characters would be attending the last movie screening of the day, a midnight movie. It took a couple drafts, but Hawkins soon found an approach to the story that he liked. At the center of the story was projectionist Stewart, who had been projecting film for over 25 years. But now, things have changed. Theaters have switched over to digital projection, and the skills Stewart has developed are no longer useful. Theater manager Clive doesn't even care if the digital projections are shown in the right aspect ratio, and he makes Stewart work the concession stand while wearing a silly little hat. So, Stewart decides to spice up his unfulfilling life by making his own movie. But he doesn't write a script and go looking for funding. Instead, he decides he's going to make his own real-life horror movie using people who come into the theater. He'll shoot it with his home camera and the security cameras placed throughout the building. And if people die during the production, well, that's just good cinema. Hawkins thought Anglin would be great for the role of Stewart, but since his movie was a low-budget British production, he also didn't think he would actually be able to cast Anglin. He sent the script to the genre legend anyway, and what happened next was the sort of event you'd see in a heartwarming movie about a guy getting the chance to live his filmmaking dreams. Hawkins told Flick Feast, quote, Apparently Robert Anglin's agent called him in the middle of the night and said that he had read the script. Before I knew it, I was on the phone with the guy that scared the crap out of me as a kid, talking about how much he loved the script and the character. It was a real honor. Anglin signed on, and now the villain in Hawkins' movie was going to be played by one of the greatest villain actors in movie history. Malachi Kirby was cast as Clive, Stewart's boss, who is much younger than he is, and Emily Barrington and Finn Jones were cast as Ali and Martin, a pair who are pursuing a relationship after recently meeting at a Halloween party, and they make the poor decision to attend a late-night showing of Wes Craven's The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. They're the only two people who attend the screening, which, if you're familiar with the movie, Movie seems pretty realistic. As soon as the couple walks through the front doors, Stewart has already chosen them to be the stars of his twisted project. When Hawkins first started writing The Last Showing, it was going to be a straightforward slasher. People get locked inside a movie theater and someone starts knocking them off one by one. But as he was writing it, he was also hating it. It was turning out to be dull and formulaic and not something he would actually want to make. So he decided to switch gears and make something more meta. That's when it became about a movie theater theater employee tormenting people because he's decided to make his own real-life horror film. At first, the villainous character was going to be the theater manager, but while doing research for the script, Hawkins talked to a few projectionists and realized it would be much more interesting to make the lead character a projectionist as well. That's because projectionists were facing a major change in their jobs at the time. See, film was being phased out and film projectors were being replaced by digital projectors. So the idea became to make Stewart a projectionist who reacted very badly to the changes in theatrical exhibition. And as Hawkins said, the change in story and character, quote, allowed me to shine a light on the genre and hopefully twist those audience expectations of the genre. The film ends up being more of a psychological horror, but I guess that's what personally scares me more than gore and blood. The timelessness of the script did cause a minor disruption in the production. When Hawkins and his crew scouted the theater filming location, there was still a film projector on the premises, perfect for a moment where Stewart is shown working with film, before digital takes over. But by the time filming began, every film projector in the theater had been replaced with a digital one. So the moment where we see Stewart handling film had to be shot at a completely different theater. When the writer slash director first envisioned the last showing, he wanted every single moment to be set inside of the movie 
movie theater. He didn't want there to be any hint of the outside world, but then a sales agent asked him if he could film some scenes in other locations and get some exterior shots. He said having those would be beneficial for the trailer because it gives the impression of the film having a wider scope and bigger production value. So the movie starts following Ali and Martin before they reach the theater. It shows them meeting at a Halloween party, talking in a restaurant, and planning their night out at the movies. The sales agent's request may also be why the cinematic moments happen on the roof of the theater. Working The Hills Have Eyes Part 2 into the script was an important element for Hawkins, even though he describes the film as, quote, pretty shockingly bad, he wanted to be able to show cliche horror movie moments as a contrast to the real horror Stewart puts Ali and Martin through. And Craven's slasher movie happened to be packed with all of the cliches that he wanted to put on the movie screen. Made on a budget of $2 million, Hawkins' own movie turned out very well. The last showing and its premiere at the 2014 edition Fright Fest, it received some decent reviews and landed a distribution deal with Sony Pictures. But despite having Robert Englund and Finn Jones in the Past, it seems to have been released directly into obscurity. There's no information on how it performed in rentals or sales, and it's not a movie that you hear referenced by members of the horror community. And that's a shame, because England is actually quite proud of the last showing, and he wishes more people had seen it over the last nine years. He told Den of Geek he enjoyed working with the director and his co-stars, saying, quote, I love the script so much, and I fell in love with Emily Barrington. It's hard not to fall in love with Emily. Then I fell in love with Phil Hawkins after a day and a half of working with him. I was like, where's he been all my life? It's wonderful to know that he knows what he wants. There's a great freedom in surrender with that kind of director. I was able to lose my vanity, lose my chin, and not worry about my bald spot. I gained some weight and put some padding on, and I had the confidence to use theater stuff. I used my physicality differently. I just went with it. It's very liberating when that happens. There's a lot of the film where Finn Jones is alone, and that's what really makes the movie work. It's the long silences, the plot accumulates accumulating, manifesting itself on Finn's character. And if Finn doesn't go there, the plot doesn't move. He has to carry that burden, and I think he's just marvelous with the arc of his character. England didn't review his own work in the movie, but when you watch it, you'll find him giving another excellent villain performance. You'll also see a demonstration of the true range he has. Stewart is a bad guy, but his villainy is nothing at all like Freddy Krueger's. He's the deceptive Weasley sort. He seems like a mild-mannered, frail old man. You would think a young guy like Finn Jones would easily be able to beat him at the game he's playing, but Stewart has planned his movie in meticulous detail. He's in full control at every moment. And since he's the bad guy, it can get frustrating to see how skilled he is at manipulating certain situations. We're rooting for Martin to find a way out of the ordeal that Stuart has put him and Allie in, but most of the time, it seems hopeless. Now, Martin is, admittedly, not the smartest character around. There are times when you'll have to suspend disbelief in order to go along with the scenarios presented by Hawkins. Martin makes some very dumb moves. Allie has some questionable scenes as well, but but we have to let that slide. She's dealing with being drugged up for most of the movie. But even when Martin or Allie have you shaking your head or yelling at the screen, the story remains intriguing. It's impressive to see how Hawkins was able to make the idea sustain the feature running time. There are very few characters and not many places for them to go, yet Hawkins made it work. We're wrapped up in the situation and hoping to see a positive outcome. And you know what? Anglin is right. Jones does give a strong performance as his dense and troubled character. He was working on Game of Thrones at the same time he was making the last showing, and could often be found sleeping on the set. But when he was awake and in front of a camera, he was very clearly giving his all. For horror fans, some of their favorite scenes may be the ones involving the screening of The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. Sure, we all know it's a lesser entry in Craven's filmography, but it's also kind of fun to see it referenced and featured in this way, and it's nice to see how much Allie appears to be enjoying this movie. This would be a sign to many of us that she's someone special, but Martin's too busy miserably hating on the horror genre to realize this, indicating that this may not be much of a love connection after all. There are several scenes where Stuart has to conceal his villainy so his plan will stay on track. But when he has a moment to indulge his evil, Anglin really gets a chance to shine and show how unique his character is. Whether he's doing a bit of additional dialogue recording for his movie or messing with Martin from the other side of the door, Anglin makes Stuart a maddening but delightful person to watch. 
Phil Hawkins worked on several more projects since the making of The Last Showing. He's made shorts, features, adventure stories, and dramas. A family-friendly Christmas movie was in there somewhere, and he even made a short Star Wars fan film. He hasn't gotten around to returning to the horror genre yet, but he has let it be known that The X-Files and Jurassic Park were his two biggest sources of inspiration. They are why he wanted to work in the entertainment industry. So chances are that he'll have more thrilling, creepy stories to share with us in the future. And when he does return to horror, it will be very, very interesting to see. He went through the horror rite of passage with The Last Showing and made a well-crafted film that deserves to be seen by a larger audience. Hopefully the next Hawkins horror film isn't so far off. But in the meantime, we recommend that you catch up on The Last Showing. Take in a midnight screening. You'll have to watch out for that creepy guy Stewart behind the concession stand, but hey, it's worth it. And if you don't want to take our word for it, then listen to it from the man himself, Robert Englund. When I was doing Last Showing, I saw where Phil Hawkins had been influenced by De Palma and even and was working like low budget De Palma. Uh, color field, I could tell by his frame sometimes and, and his use of suspense and just how smart the film was uh, and, and his sense of humor. And, and, and Phil's just this amazing filmmaker. So I knew I was in good hands, but the real secret of that film is the performance by Finn Jones, who I discovered, you know, in, Th in, in Game of Thrones. But Finn is so raw in that film. And he's, he, he does that trick where he realizes everything that's happened to him is the audience knows about. The audience knows every so when you watch Finn, you get you, you get this 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 tightening in your stomach. I'm there and I'm good in the film and I'm your I, I'm I'm your antagonist. But without Finn's, you know, Finn is the sacrificial lamb, and the audience knows that, and they get more and more frustrated as, as poor Finn goes down the rabbit hole with all of my traps, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, and his performance. He's he gauged it. You know, so wonderfully. I remember I used to see him. He was doing, he might have been doing Game of Thrones at the same time. He had to keep going up north, and I'm presuming Belfast. But mm -hmm. I would see him, you know, he, he has that trick where he could just fall asleep anywhere. <laughs> and I couldn't tell, I, for a while I thought, well, my God, we're beating him up here. You know, he's so in character. It's just exhausting. But I think he was also rushing up to do some stuff on Game of Thrones at the same time. But his performance is just amazing. I mean, Emily Barrington's wonderful too. Everybody's good in that movie, but but Finn, it's just a really, really raw nerve. And he's realized that he can tap into the viewer at home or in the movie theater uh, because he knows they know everything he knows. And that's happened to me a couple of times in plays. And you just, you know, there's a moment where you just feel the audience, you've got them in the palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Finn sort of drags them through the hell that is his his part of the movie. But uh, yeah, I I really like that movie. I think it's and it's just it's a real kiss huh, to the to horror fans. Yes, yeah. it, it really uh, 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 salutes horror fans and the genre. Uh, yeah. And and I think it's a bit of a, a, a Valentine to horror fans. So I hope more people discover. It. I guess the problem is the title because. Last, the last showing <laughs> sounds like a runway show, you know, mm -hmm. in London, a fashion show with Alexander McQueen models or something. <laughs> I, 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 shall I watch this documentary called Last <laughs> Showing? No, it's not. It's it's it. That's the way the Brits say midnight movie, mm -hmm. the last movie that's screened during, uh, uh, you know, at, during the day. Yeah. The midnight movie is the last showing. Uh, but I, I wanted them to call it Midnight Movie here in North America, but they kept it last showing. And I, I think it confused audiences. 